There's a message I believe God wants to say to each and every one of us today. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Job. It's funny because last week we read the book of Solomon. Psalm of Solomon, excuse me. And the Psalm of Solomon and the Proverbs and the book of Job all are considered poetic books. Poetic. That's why sometimes, you know, we want to, we, we need to read it like we're reading poetry. Amen? Y'all with me? Yes. Chapter 14 of the book of Job. We're going to read verse 1. And then we're going to go to verse 14. The book of Job, chapter 14. The book of Job, chapter 14. Verse 1, and it reads, Man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Man who is born of woman is a few days but full or and full of trouble. And then verse 14 says, If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. The, new, uh, the King James Version says this in verse 14. The second half of verse 14, King James. It says, All the days of my appointed time, I shall await until my change comes. Amen? Now, when I was looking and seeking the Lord for the message for today, this scripture that my father used to speak years and years, over and over, sort of kind of resonated with me. And, and, and we, who are in the Mumford household, used to do a scripture. Y'all know we used to say that. Used to do a scripture every Sunday morning at the breakfast table. Even before you eat, we had to say a Bible verse. And we started with the easy one, Jesus wept. Two words. But then you had to progress. And at some point, each one of us started adapting and, 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 and finding our own scripture that we called our own. And I remember my father used to say this one over and over. And all of a sudden, I began to, after I left the house, and, and at some point, and I was told to do this, I used to say the same scripture. All the days of my appointed time, I shall await until my change comes. And I never really understood it at that time, but I, I remembered it. So it has something, you know, there's something good about repetition. There's something good about when you say something over and over and over because it gets a part of who you are. See, I don't have to memorize the scripture. That's in me. All the days of my appointed time, I shall await until my change comes. That's something that's in me, but I never really understood it. So as I was seeking the Lord today, or, or this week, and I came to this message, the Lord brought back to my remembrance this scripture. All the days of my appointed time, or in this case, hard service, I will wait till my change comes. So the message the Lord gave me is there's something about us waiting. There's something that we have to do in our waiting. Waiting is not easy sometimes. Amen? So the message is simply this. Wait on the Lord and keep hope alive. Wait on the Lord and keep hope alive. Amen? Can I get an amen out there? Amen. 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 Alright. I mean, I'll let me know if I'm out there. So I, I hope so. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would just use me as a vessel in your hands. Lord, hide me behind the cross and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For you are my God. You are my Redeemer. You are my strength. You are my maker. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Let the church say amen. Amen and amen. Job said, all the days of my appointed time, I shall await until my change comes. How many know that one of the most difficult things to do is when you're waiting on something is to keep your hope alive? How many
only know that while you're waiting on the prayer to be answered, whatever your prayer has been, whatever struggle you might have gone through, even the new thing we might be looking for God to do, how many know that while you're waiting, sometimes we wonder what's taking so long? And while we're waiting on what's taking so long, if we're not careful, we can have a moment of flesh, which will cause us not to keep hope alive, but it will cause us to get a little discouraged. And so being discouraged means we're no longer walking by faith. Being discouraged means your flesh just kicked in, and I call it this, naturally natural. See, naturally is just a moment that your flesh just takes over. But it's a natural act because part of us is flesh. See, though we're born again and we have the Spirit of God, there's a flesh that we have to still deal with. And that flesh is still natural. So sometimes, depending on what we're going to do, the thoughts that go in our head, sometimes, depending on what we have to face, we might have a moment of being naturally natural. I don't know if y'all got that. Amen. All right. Hopefully y'all got that. Naturally mad, natural is when your flesh wants to dominate your spirit. Now somebody say, somebody say, just say amen for me. Just say somebody, somebody yell out, amen, pastor. Amen, See, pastor. at a moment of a weakness, your flesh is strong. When your spirit, who is trying to be, to get us to be renewed in our mind to think like Jesus, when the spirit of God is trying to get us to walk like Jesus, we still got to wrestle with the flesh. And so the flesh has been with us all our lives. We might have just got born again last week. Who do you think is the strongest of the two when you have not yet submitted to God? So you can get saved, but not submitted. Submitted means Jesus is Lord. Submitted means I'm going to follow his way and not my way. Amen? But this waiting thing, we go through, regardless of what it is you're waiting on, you go through moments where we are just, our hope might be a little shaky. Our hope that we started off with that is on fire for the Lord, that we're walking by faith, we're telling folks, we're all excited about what the Lord is going to do, because he hasn't done it yet, but by faith we're believing it, so we're all excited about that, but it's taking so long, and we started thinking, why is it taking so long? And during that time of waiting, what you might encounter is some folks that might not be trying to encourage you to keep on waiting. What you might find is some folks that says, take matters into your own hands. See, now let's look at Job. See, Job, this story of Job, chapter 14. He's not talking to the Lord. He says, man is born of a woman in his few days, a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. So he says, well, who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to Eliphaz, he's talking to Zophar, and he's talking to Bildad, which is Job's three friends. Now, y'all know the story of Job, most of y'all, I believe, that Job was one that you heard me say in Bible study, there's none like him, God said. God was bragging on Job. He says, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him, blameless, upright, one who fears God and shuns evil. Well, Satan said back to God, and keep in mind this conversation between God and Satan, Job has no clue. He's just going about doing what he does. But Satan and, and God has got a conversation going on, and Satan says to God, have Job served you for nothing? Remove your head and let me get at him, basically, and I'll make him curse you to your face. And so the story goes that God says, so be it. He gives Satan permission to come against his servant, his child, Job. But he says, the one thing you can't do, don't lay a hand on this person. Like, don't touch his soul. And Satan says, I got this, I got this, because there's not a man, there's not a human that has been here, and Jesus had not came yet, but there's not a man alive that can withstand me. And so Satan comes and he brings torment. He, he causes chaos. He kills his, his sheep, his herd, his oxen. He kills his, his children. He has a 
the seven sons and three daughters and all of them died. He kills all the servants and they keep one by one coming to him and telling him, hey, this is what else has happened. So one servant just constantly brings bad news and then that one dies and another one comes and then they bring them bad news. And, and before long, Job is just like, what is going on? about us. God knows who is faithful and who is not faithful. God knows who will withstand the attack from the adversary so he can get some glory. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Amen. Amen. And so this story is going on and Job, the Bible says that Satan came a second time because the first time Job didn't budge. Job was still faithful like God knew he was going to be both faithful. Job did not curse God and die like Satan said he was going to make him do. So Satan comes back and I just love God because God said the same thing to Satan that he said the first time. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. Blameless, upright, one who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan says, a man will give his life for his, 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 his person. Like, like, let me come against his flesh. Let me, let me break him out with some sickness. Let me, let me cause him some pain. And I guarantee I'll make him Christian. God says, so be it. Don't touch his soul. You can do anything you want to do to Job. The Bible says, and Satan broke out sores upon Job from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And then and the scholars, some say, these sores were like leprosy You know what Elvin Titus looks like? It's gross looking. And imagine leprosy on top of that. He said that's what it looked like. And it was Job, the Bible says that Job got so discouraged because of what he looked like, what he felt like, the pain he was in, the, the people turning on him, his friends turning on him, his family now is gone because remember they killed his children, his wife was now still telling him stuff that he don't need to hear, like curse God and die. Why don't you just curse God and die? Job says, you're talking to a foolish woman. Naked I came in this world and naked I leave this world. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still gave God praise. But yet he's still carrying this pain. He's still being abhorred by everybody. Now he's got three friends. Be careful who your friends are. He's got three friends that's coming to him. Each one of them are telling them, because they don't know the story either, by the way. Each one of them are telling them, telling Job, surely you've done something. Because God doesn't punish us for nothing. How many know that we don't know everything about God? Amen. Because Amen. the first thing they said is, God did it. Now let me show you something. Just so you'll see that Job didn't know what was going on either. Chapter 13. Stay right there. Remember me in 14. Let's look over in chapter 13. This is Job, verse 1 of 13, talking to the three who have tried to tell him he's done something wrong. And they try to, because they're, they're, you know, they, they, they know scripture and they, they know the word of God. And they're trying to be eloquent and they're speaking to Job. And Job says, verse 1, Behold, my house. My eye has seen all this. My ear has heard and understand and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. But I would speak to the Almighty. Come on now. See, see, sometimes you might not need to talk to your friends about the stuff you're going through. Sometimes you need to just take it straight to God and say, God, am I missing something? See, he says, I will speak to the Almighty. And I desire to reason with God. But you forgers of lies, you are all witnesses, or excuse me, you are all what? Worthless physicians. Wow. Oh, that you would be silent, and if it would be your wisdom. Now hear my reasoning, and heed the pleadings of my lips. Will, this is what he talked to his friends. Will you speak wickedly for God? And talk deceitfully for him? Will you show partiality for him? Will you contend for God? He's he, he telling his friends, are you trying to take the place of God and deal with me? And I know just as much as you know? Yeah. Now here's 
way he, he really, Job doesn't understand, this is not God doing it. Down in verse 13, he says, Hold your peace with me and let me speak. Then let come on me what may. Why do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hands? Here it is. Though he, God, slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job is saying, though God is bringing all this on me, I'm still going to trust him. He don't realize this is not God bringing it on him. And it's God and Satan having this whole thing going on that he don't realize that God is going to get some glory because God knows that Job is going to pass the test. God knows that Job is going to be faithful. He wouldn't have pointed Satan to him. See, understand, Satan can only do what God allows him to do. So if Satan is messing with you, God is allowing it. We don't know why. It could be anything. It could be God wants some glory and he knows you're a woman and man of faith and you're going to stand the test. Or it could be God wants to discipline. We don't know. But that's the good news about what we are go what we are getting to when we get to these three points. We're not there yet. But here's what I want to see. I want you to see. Job was wrestling with the good times and the bad times. And I'm talking about the moments where he's trusting God with all his heart and the bad times where he's like, just kill me. I wish I was never born. That's when Job starts to talk about I, it would have been better for me if I had never even, look, I would have been better if I had died at birth. Not aborted, not abortion, but born dead. That way my life wouldn't be the way it is now. That's how bad I feel. But then you have Job on the other side in verse 16. He is also he also shall be my salvation. For a hypocrite could not come before him. Job was telling his friends, wait a minute. I wouldn't even be able to talk to God if I was a hypocrite. I wouldn't even be able to go to God and say and find out what it is that I am doing, have done wrong, or why is it that you're bringing this on me if I was a hypocrite? Have you ever been in a place in yourself where you've been praying and asking God for something that's it, it, not happening and, and, and you can believe Job was asking God over and over. This goes up to like what, 50 chapters? And he, he goes and he's, he's talking, Lord, why is this happening? And people say, it's not good to test God. Well, it's not good to test God, but it's good to go to God. Yeah. It's good to ask God, why are things happening? See, the Bible didn't say that Job did anything wrong by going to God and asking why these things are happening. See, look. Look in verse 20. These, this is Job's prayer to God. He says, only two things do I do not do to me, God. This is what he's saying to God. Only two things I'm asking you not to do to me. Then I will not hide myself from you. One, don't withdraw your hand far from me. And two, let not the dread of you make me afraid. Job says, one, don't leave me. Don't ever leave me nor forsake me. Don't ever leave me out here by myself. Two, don't let me fear you so much that I'm so afraid that I can't even turn to you. See, guilt and sin will cause us, if the devil has his way, he will cause you to not want to go back to God and say, I'm sorry. Guilt and sin will cause you to turn away. When you're condemned, See, that's what happened to Judas, remember? Judas sinned, betrayed Jesus, and ran from Jesus. Peter denied him. But the Bible says, Peter, when you return, strengthen the brother. Which means Peter was going to turn back to, G to Jesus. Amen? All right, y'all with me? Y'all ready for your three points? I ain't going to keep you long. This is... Oh, okay, sorry. Here we go. When we're talking about Waiting on God. Amen? And we say we want to keep hope alive, right? Here's the three things I want you to do. One, know whom to turn to. Don't be talking to any and everybody. Don't be trusting that, you know, the, 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 the pastor included. Don't be looking at me saying, I, I need some counseling, right? 
but you don't know God. Don't, don't be coming to your friends, but you don't know God. See, see you better know God for yourself. Because a man can make a mistake. See, not only did Elias and Zophar and, and Bildad, which is his friends, told him the wrong thing, gave them the wrong counsel, these were men of God. But then you had the priest come behind them. A descendant of Abraham, the Bible says. And he also gave bad instruction. And just so you know, it was bad. If you follow me, we're going to come back, but if you follow me over to chapter 42, which is the last, actually, that's the last chapter. But if you go over to chapter 42, amen, and look at verse 7, and it says, And so it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, that the Lord said to Elipheus the Tenemite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends. Hello. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as right, as my servant Job did or has. See, regardless of Job's struggle, regardless of Job's rustling back and forth and all that, Job never said anything wrong about, about God or what God's motive is or anything like that. Job just didn't understand what was happening to him. Have you been in a situation where you just don't know why stuff is happening? Just when you think I'm taking a step forward, all of a sudden I seem like I get pushed back too? How did this happen? And you don't know? Well, God knows. Who do you want to go to? Go to God. But you better know who you go to. Don't just go to God and you don't know him. Amen? He says, but listen, he says, but therefore, take for yourselves, that he's talking, God is talking to Elias. Take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept him. He can say I'll accept you three guys. Lest I deal with you according to your folly. Because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job did. Amen. How many know that those three brothers went and they, they got that bowl and they went to Job and they offered up a sacrifice and said, please pray for me. Not go right back to God. See, they were not in position to go to God because God has saw that what they were saying was wrong. Be careful how you, who you look. Be careful who your friends are. Amen? So the first thing is, know whom you turn to when you're in trouble. Amen. And that's what we read in Job 13, 1 through 7. Number two. I love this one. Go to Acts chapter 16. You all were doing it all day today. Acts chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. But at midnight, Paul and Silas was praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains, chains were loose. Number two, we need to sing a song. Amen. When you are waiting on the Lord and you want to keep hope alive, the best thing you can do is start singing. Because see, what we talked about when we were singing that song just a little while ago, how the song, you start singing and you sing it to yourself and you start motivating yourself. Songs, I ain't talking about any old song. I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about gospel singing. I'm talking about songs that has Jesus in it. Song that says, I know that my Redeemer lives. I'm talking about song that says, yes, Jesus loves me. I'm talking about song that you're going to sing over and over that as you're singing it, you're getting encouragement. So your hope doesn't dwindle. You become more and more Fire. Amen? Amen. Number three. How you wait shows your faith. How you wait shows basically shows what you made of. See, if you're a woman or man of, of faith and you say, oh, I'm believing God for something and then some trouble comes your way, how you're waiting on God to deliver you from that thing, will then show everybody else whether you really truly are a man or woman of faith. Because if you're a man or woman of faith, that, that's not going to disturb, whatever it is, it's not going to disturb your peace. See, here's what hope does. I know I missed one place. Here's what hope does. Hope produces. Hope produces peace. Y'all got that? Hope produces peace. Hope produces joy. See, when you're hoping and believe in God for something? Yeah, yeah. Aren't you in, 
and through God, you're more encouraged to wait on God. I had to go back because I knew I missed something here. This is one of those areas when you're talking about waiting on God and you want to keep hope alive. You must, you must, you need to underline those words, must hope. You must sing songs. You must listen to the gospel. You must open up the scriptures and, and begin to read the Bible. You must get some kind of word in you somehow, some way, because your hope is only going to be built on what? There's, what's that song go? There's nothing less. No, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not sweetest holy on Jesus' name. See, my hope is built on what? Jesus Christ. Yeah. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking. You see what I mean? That's a song. But in that song, it's telling you what to build your hope on. Build your hope on Jesus. Jesus says, I am the word made flesh. So if I'm going to get Jesus, I need to get the word, whether it's through the song, whether it's through written, whatever it is. Amen? Now let's get back to point number three. Point number two was what? Sing a song. Amen? When you sing a song, it brings Jesus into the mix. Because you're singing a gospel. You're singing a song with him in mind. And when you're singing a song with him in mind, you're blessing God. You're blessing Jesus. And you know you can't out-bless Jesus. Amen? Number three. How you wait shows your faith, right? Now this is, this is, look at chapter 16 and look at verses 27 down to 34. This is, this is the same story of Paul and Silas. And it says, And the keeper of the prisoner, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he, the, 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 uh, the guard, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Now here's what I want you to see. What it was that caused this whole dynamic and story to happen for this prisoner guard? They were listening to Paul and Silas singing. They're in prison. Why are they singing? They should be upset. They should be stomping and, and, and kicking the walls and, and cursing and everything else. But they're singing and praying songs and hymns. And it's something about when you're a witness for God, your faith is being watched. Based on how you're waiting. When you look, as you wait, here we go, what I say? How you wait shows your faith. And how they were waiting by singing and said, praying, God did something supernatural. He opened the prisoner's doors without the key. And when they, yeah, yeah, they were all loose. And when they opened the prisoner's doors and they were loose, that man, the prisoner, the guard, was about to kill himself. Because he knew he was in trouble with Caesar, or with the, the king. He knew he was in trouble and he was going to die. He said, let me just take my life. And he said, hold on. Wait, we're all here. We're all here because we ain't got to run. We're all here because we ain't got to worry about what you're going to do. If God before, you see the doors open, right? I, I, I can sit there and see Paul and Silas and I'll pay. You see the doors, right? You see the change, right? I ain't have no key. I ain't, this, ain't no, this ain't no magic trick. Just and, and what was it that caused them in the first place to say, what must I do be, to be saved? How did they know who Paul and Silas was? Because they were singing songs that had Jesus in the midst. They were praying. And you know they were praying, Lord Jesus, help me. Lord Jesus, has saved me. Lord Jesus. You know, they, this guy is sitting outside 
we got one of these, these fanatical Christians in here again. But he's hearing. He's hearing. He's listening. And when the miracle happened at midnight, in the last hour, right when you think it's time to give up, yeah. hello, Come on now. right when you think it's, it's all over, yeah. all your waiting is not in vain when you're waiting with a hope in Jesus. Yeah. See, that's the thing you need to walk away with and more than anything else. As long as you're waiting, believing that Jesus is going to show up in your situation, yeah. it's going to happen. Don't worry how long it is. Keep on waiting. The Bible says what? Wait, wait on the Lord. Again, I say, wait on the Lord. Be of good cheer. And you what? Wait on the Lord. Be of good cheer. Again, I say, he says, wait on the Lord. So what I want you to know is this. The number one, if you're going to wait on God, but keep hope alive, number one, you need to do what? Know whom to turn to while you're waiting. When you're starting to get a little discouraged, when you're starting to feel like all hope is gone, that's when you need to go to God and say, Lord, what is going on? Because, see, I want you to know the end of the story, if I was to go back here real quick to Job, the end of the story is simply this. The Bible says, give me one second. The Bible says in verse chapter 42 of Job, verse 10, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. After Job, see, Job didn't hold anything against those friends that he was he was talking to. Job, there's some of us would have been like, everyone, everything y'all saying to me, I already know. So why you keep telling me this? You know, don't you see me? You know. See, the thing about Job and, and that, that, that whole thing from the head to the toes or, or the soles of his feet that got him covered, the thing that, that we need to know is that Job smelled bad. The Bible says his breath was, a, was a, uh, uh, like, like, like bad to his wife. His wife.